production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High. Meet the spirit animals of Compton Construction. One day I just had this idea, like why not do some kind of artistic representation of our employees' spirits animals out on the job sites. And if you can't beat them, eat them. We'll take you to a cook-off featuring some unexpected ingredients. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Do you have a spirit animal? I do, and I'm pretty sure it's Liz Lemon from 30 Rock, but this is a personality question that Blake Compton likes to ask his new and prospective employees. And now, with the help of a local artist, Mandy Kasky, the spirit animals of Compton Construction can be seen temporarily adorning the walls at his company's work sites. I'm looking for white and like a, a dark blue because I'll be painting a polar bear. Um, these are just going to be filler colors so I can just get rid of some of that wood. So I own a commercial construction company called Comp Construction. It's, uh, I started it in 2012 and we focus on renovation, adaptive reuse, and uh, mixed-use projects here in Central Ohio. Some of the bigger marquee projects of our company's history are Land Grant Brewing Company um, and the Columbus Idea Foundry. When we, when we interview people, we generally, um, over the years, have you know, asked normal questions that any, any employer would ask. After I started to understand how to interview people, I realized you kind of had to like inject some of your own culture in the interview process, and some of it's just like odd, being odd and being different. And so, you know, in between asking about your experience and asking about like, you know, the type of work ethic you have, I threw in what's your spirit animal, and I said a buffalo. I look like a buffalo. It's a, a strong, stoic animal. So over time, I kind of built up this list of spirit animals, and, and then one day I just had this idea like, oh my god, why not do some kind of artistic representation of uh, our employees' spirits animals out on the job sites to kind of to, to connect the art community to the construction process. I really like what Blake's doing with this. I mean, it, it gets more people um, aware that we can create public art for not only like uh, murals or just uh, street art but it can also be for like a marketing kind of thing but you can also give the artists freedom to create what they want and that's kind of what Blake did he was just like just gave me the list of animals and he was like okay go at it and uh, well, I was like all right you trust me that's good <laughs> Each animal has an accessory, a hat, um, you know, earrings, a scarf, something like that. So my spirit animal is a falcon. So it has an eye patch and um, falcons actually have like really great eyesight. So I'm not really sure how the eye patch fits in. Oh no, the eye patch was the only way to go. Uh, just because it just looks pretty badass. <laughs> Well, I want to make sure I have one for every employee. So right now, I think um, we have 12, and we need to do like three or four more. I did one of this this guy, I forget his name, but he was the buffalo, and he had like all these tattoos and stuff. And so I put the guys, like the, his actual tattoos on the horns of the buffalo. <laughs> I loved it, I thought it was great. I thought it was an accurate depiction. 
it, it is a way to advertise that advertising. It's a way to say, hey, I saw your spirit animal. What are you doing there? So now I get to tell a story rather than just being like, oh yeah, I'm doing construction at this building. I think Blake comes up with a lot of great ideas that are sort of outside of the box, and I think Compton is very unique in that way with the ideas that we have. So I think this is just another one of them. View more of Compton's spirit animals and find out where you can spot them around town by visiting CompTonLLC.com. So you might not know that dandelions are actually an invasive species. They're native to Europe and early settlers brought them here to grow in their gardens for medicinal purposes well, and for food. We've all heard about dandelion wine, but what about dandelion quiche? Out in Oregon, there is an annual cook-off that aims to eat away at the problem of invasive species. Call it eradication by mastication. Here's more. Bullfrogs are a major predator in aquatic systems. So they eat essentially everything they can stuff into their mouths. Fish, other frogs, they eat small birds, ducklings, goslings, they'll eat rodents. And really, the only thing that seems to limit their ability to eat things is the size of their mouth. American bullfrogs are an invasive species. They spread diseases that can wipe out native frogs. Out here, they're missing many of their natural predators and diseases, so they do very well in this landscape. Get our gear together here. Tom Kay wants to turn the tables on these hungry predators by putting them on the dinner table. But he has to catch them first. So there's one right there. You see the glint off its eyes. Mm -hmm. and it looks like there's several right along the bank there. The frogs are less likely to leap away from you in the dark. We spotlight them with a flashlight, and then another person creeps up from a different direction with a spear and then makes a final plunge to catch the frog. Nice. Tom directs the Institute for Applied Ecology in Corvallis. The group restores native habitat in Oregon. That means facing the daunting task of controlling invasive species. Lately, they've been eating away at the problem. Welcome to the 2015 Invasive Species Cook-Off. The Institute draws people to its cause by showcasing invasive species in an annual feast and cooking competition. Many invasive species are quite edible and quite delicious even. For example, bullfrog legs are quite delectable. In fact, you know, they taste like chicken. Ecologist Ben Axt is targeting a different aquatic invader for the cook-off, a crayfish that can take over lakes and ponds from native species. These are red swamp crayfish. They're an invasive crayfish species in Oregon. You can tell it's red swamp crayfish from the native one because it has these bumps on the claws. These are from Louisiana area. These came in through science classrooms, bringing them into classrooms to learn about nature and then releasing them into our waterways here. These are tasty. I'm gonna steam them up and make them into a kind of a crab dip. Should be pretty good. Ben is confident about his chances in the cook-off. They do taste a lot like little lobsters or little crabs. And starting with something as good as crayfish is definitely the best way to go. He's adding two invasive plants to the crayfish dip for what he calls the cream cheese triple threat. I'm going to put a dollop of my cream cheese mixture onto the toast and then chop up my crayfish and top it with that. And then top that with a couple other invasive species, a sweet pea vine and some carrot flour. Institute board member Bob Hansen has something sweeter in mind. These are non-native Himalayan wild blackberries that basically take over a habitat and become a monoculture. For the cook-off, Bob's making blackberry scones. And I love these scones. They're what I call Pacific Northwest hand-thrown scones, and they take on kind of a very wild and unstructured life of their own. And this gets pretty messy. I haven't expanded to other non-natives yet, but I think that's one of the beauties of this invasive species cook-off. It causes us to think bigger about what the possibilities are. 
Meanwhile, botanist Jenny Kramer is going after another thorny plant. We're out here to collect Canada thistle. And this is an invasive species here in Oregon. It's all over the state. It's all over the country. It's actually pretty much all over the northern hemisphere. You'll find it in places that are disturbed. Usually there's been either some development or logging of some kind. If you go to a place and there's just tons and tons of thistle, we're probably not going to get rid of it there. But if you come to a place and there's just a few thistles like this meadow, you actually can make a really big difference on a local site level. She'll cook the plants into a quiche. With some of the lower stems, what I'll do is I'll peel back the skin, and it's really tender and tasty, and they're less, just like asparagus. You can eat it raw, but I'm going to cook it in butter because I want to win. At home, Jenny cuts dandelion greens from her backyard, a second invasive plant for the quiche. So we've got dandelions and thistles here, and um, basically what we're going to do is, because the thistles have thorns, I'm going to boil them down first just to make sure I don't get any pokies in the judge's mouth. And then we'll saute all this goodness with some other things. While the thistles cook in one pan, the dandelion greens go in another. So now we have dandelions, leeks, shiitake mushrooms, basil, oregano, sage, and a whole lot of butter. I am masking the wild flavors a little bit on purpose because they are pretty potent and we want it to taste good as well as be eradicating our invasive species. Yep, I think we're good to go. At the cook-off, the tables fill with invasive species creations. Tom fries up his frog legs with Cajun spices and cornmeal. There's an interesting ew factor around eating some invasive species like nutria or frog legs. It really seems odd to a lot of people, and so they're at the same time uh, repulsed and fascinated. Very good. Excellent. Then he sizes up the other dishes. We've got the dandelion pesto made with dandelion greens. That looks delicious. So this is the invasive species triple threat. It's got red swamp crayfish, sweet pea vine, and carrot flowers. I'm nervous about the crayfish. That's competition for the frog legs. Over here is the starling bacon kebabs with a blackberry reduction sauce. The bacon wrapped starlings is a ringer I hadn't seen coming, so uh, now I'm really worried. Okay, so here's how the judging is gonna work. Each dish will be judged in terms of its presentation, its creativity, its taste, and its conservation benefit. The judges give each dish an overall score. The frog legs are a hit. They're very flavorful. But the crayfish dip scores higher. The results are in. The number one in savory meat was the cream cheese triple threat by Ben Axt. The first place for the savory vegetarian dish was the Canada thistle dandelion quiche prepared by Jenny Kramer. In the end, Tom says, eating invasive species isn't really the solution. It tastes like chicken, but it's sweeter. But it does get people's attention. We don't really think that we're going to eat our way out of this problem. It's really an awareness method to bring people to the table, literally, to eat them and talk about them and the damage they're doing in a more lighthearted environment. Because, let's face it, some of the impacts they're having are pretty devastating and kind of depressing. And it's important to maintain our enthusiasm uh, in the face of a, a problem like that. Well, you know, it's not half bad. <laughs> you say so yourself. But I say so myself. Learn more about the invasive species of Ohio by visiting our State Department of Natural Resources. You can learn to identify invasive plants like the Japanese honeysuckle and find tips on how to incorporate native species into your landscaping. Visit ohiodnr.gov. Social justice, racism, Black Lives Matter, these are hot-button issues in both press and politics this year. Dayton artist James Pate hopes his charcoal drawings have the power to spark conversations about all of these topics and perhaps even inspire social change. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. I was raised by my grandparents and later moved to Dayton 
where I live now. I consider myself a, a self-taught artist because I spent a lot of time just making art on my own and researching and doing projects that caused me to educate myself about the production of art and creative process. This has been a continuous journey of learning from making the arts. I've developed methods just from working uh, because from working and actually going through the act of producing art, you discover different methods. You know, I developed a technique that I call techno-cubism, and it's a style that encompasses cross-hatching, architectural rendering, and cubistic form building. The different mediums that I like to use range from graphite, charcoal, oil, and acrylic paint. I like working on different surfaces. I'm working on a piece that I call Middle School Revolt, and it depicts a middle school age kid sitting at his school desk holding a slave ship, and he's watching a slave ship revolt. And this part was very interesting for me to do because I had to design a fight scene. I had to really think about the details of what would happen and the clothing and the weapons that were used and that sort of things. I wanted to play with the words middle because it relates to middle passage and revolt because a lot of African-American kids are not familiar with the fact that there was a struggle I thought it was important to do this piece to inspire students to stick with education. The Ken Killing Can exhibit was conceived as a result of conversations with people in my community, the Black community. So the Klan is sort of a metaphor for Black on Black violence and a recurring statement that we're doing this destruction that the Klan would do to ourselves. And so as an artist, I decided I would take that on and try to visualize what that looked like. And the first thing that came to mind was Klan's traditional garments and putting the traditional garments on black people, mainly black males, and showing them causing destruction to each other. One of the reasons why I did the pieces was very personal. I got the blues about the situation because I have a deep love for humanity. I figured if I flesh out these pieces and express myself, hopefully the audience will look at it and relate to it and it would cause for healing to take place you know, in their lives. One of the main goals is to have the exhibit travel to as many places as it possibly can so that students primarily could look at pieces and walk away with a sense of responsibility for oneself and one's community. The solution to social ills is very complicated and very layered. And the one thing that I try to do with my art is to spark a conversation. Because it's the first process in an action plan. When you start the dialogue, what happens is that you discover ideas for solutions and these works were meant to do just that. It's very important to view visual art as a means to communicate, to view it as an actual language that that you can read and learn something from it. Working with students to make art in a large scale is a really good opportunity for collaboration. The execution that has to take place with producing a mural helps with the practice of learning the language of visual art. When I'm working with students in particular, doing projects, I want them to know that you could learn this language and you can use this language to express yourself. And again, before you actually scratch, I want you to let me critique your drawing part. For my work to uh, reach as many people as it has reached is very, 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 very gratifying. And it's very important for me personally as an artist, but at the same time, it's very difficult for me to actually celebrate the accomplishment. 
because of the subject matter. The experience of receiving a governor's award it just caught me completely by surprise. It's a pleasure to honor James Pate with the Individual Artist Award and his artistic talent, commitment to community outreach and education, and willingness to engage in the important public dialogue is unmatched. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Pate. I'm a humble person by nature anyways, and I just simply couldn't believe it, but I appreciate it. It's just tremendous, and I just never thought in my wildest dreams that I would be being recognized, especially on that level and in that way for, you know, making art. The driving force is my deep love for humanity and the human capacity. Looking at what people have done throughout history is it's extremely uplifting and motivating. And it drives me to want to make a contribution in the same sorts of ways. Having a chance to go to the different cities, interact with the community and talk to students and learn and share is just all part of the overall plan and the overall hope just to assist in change. And now we head to Reynoldsburg to visit graphic artist Dean Arnold. This time of year, he applies his skills and his tools to a much more seasonal canvas. This guy has his own personality and he doesn't share it with anybody else. I saw some extreme pumpkins that it weren't like anything I'd seen before and I just thought, that looks like an awful lot of fun, I, I should try that. Yeah, I've carved a jack-o'-lantern before. Let's see how far I can take it. Well, generally, I'm looking for the shape. Um, tall pumpkins make great open-mouthed scream faces um, or real more realistic faces, um, whereas wide pumpkins make really great grins, and you can really exaggerate the, the expression. Heaviness is a big thing, too, because the heavier it is, the easier it's going to be to carve. I don't hollow out the pumpkin. I just carve the surface of it. So all I do is shave off the, the rind and then just immediately start. First thing is to decide on an expression. The more extreme and exaggerated, the better. This could be a surprised face on this side. This could be a scowling face on this side. I like to know which way the stem is going to be facing. So I don't, I don't want to carve something that where the, where the stem disappears and you don't see it later on. The way it starts is, is I, I take a large tool, a scraping tool, just at random expose some of the meat. Once I've gotten the rind off of, of the center area, I don't know what it's exactly it's going to be yet. All right, I have decided this one is going to be scowling with his brow, but he's going to be grinning widely with an evil grin. So I start just kind of digging out the eye orbits and around the nose. It depends on, on how the pumpkin cooperates with me. I have one X-Acto knife that I use for the, for the final tiny little details, like when I'm cutting the teeth or something like that. Um, but almost everything is, is just a scraping tool. These things are like sandpaper, it's like they make great smoothing tools. Whenever I get to this point, I have this overwhelming memory trace of when I'm at my dentist and my dental hygienist is flossing me. They all rot, they all rot at about the same pace, but they generally last about two days before the nose starts to shrivel up and, and dry. And, and usually by the time I do throw them out, it, I have to use a shovel. 
Last year it was just an experiment to see if I could do it. This year is less of an experiment. It's the, exper the experiment's still there, but now it's to see how well I can do it. I'm nuts! Are you kidding? <laughs> It's a compulsion. That's our show. Thanks again to our friends here at 400 West Rich for letting us in this week. Meanwhile, keep up with us at WOSU.org and check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing today's show with the local sounds of Pale Gray Lore and a track off their self-titled debut album. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.